As we're looking at this message, heaven, will you be going there? I got a lot of comments about last week's message, and I, I, I get that. A lot of people said that was a little harsh, don't you think? Uh, boy, pastor, heavy, heavy. One person said heavy, heavy, heavy. And, and it don't, I felt horrible. I just want you to know, I'm just humanly speaking, I felt horrible going home after third service uh, because I felt like I had beaten you guys, and a shepherd's never to beat the sheep. Uh, but then the Lord strengthened my heart. The Lord strengthened my heart, and he gave me, just him and I together, he said to me, and it's kind of cool because it was, it, was, it was this. It was not the one, but it was a little bit of a hint. Jack, well done. Jack, well done. It was not, it was not yet well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm waiting for that one later, but it was Jack, well done. You're fine. Jack, you're fine with me. You, you told them what I said to them 2,000 years ago in the printed word, and, and yet... God reminded me because uh, during that time, in between services, especially young people, came to me with tears, actual tears, saying, I need to be saved. And listen, that makes everything, if we can give Satan a punch in the eye any day, that's a good day. That's a good day. And so we have interrupted our normal uh, teachings to go through this series called Futures. We're looking at heaven. Will you be going there? And uh, today's going to be uh, really the fourth installment on this particular topic. And we're going to do our scripture reading together in a moment. Remain standing. I have been, I've taken it upon myself to learn more and more in light of the attacks against him. I, I picked up books and I began reading about Christopher Columbus. And I'm being absolutely blown away. And now certainly assured as to why the United States of America has more statues of Christopher Columbus in the 50 states than any other uh, person who's enshrined in statue form, including George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. Did you know that? I didn't know that. There are nearly 700 statues throughout the United States of Christopher Columbus. I didn't know that in 1492 he was commissioned Uh, by the king and queen of Spain to find a new trade route because of Europe's wars with the pirates of the Barbary Coast, the Muslim terrorists of the Mediterranean. I didn't know that. I just thought in modern reports that Columbus became some lunatic, murderous, bloodthirsty freak and terrorized the Atlantic. No, that's That's what you get out of modern-day public school teaching, it turns out. Christopher Columbus's parents had a vision regarding him before he was even born about what God was going to do with him. But one of the things I read this week was fascinating to me as he was landing for the first time, Europeans coming to the various islands of the Caribbean, which, this has nothing to do with the Bible study. But, um, Carib, Caribbean. It is true. Columbus, he and his men armed themselves and went after a group and slaughtered them. Called the Caribs. You know why? They were cannibals. They were eating other islanders on the other islands. And the islanders were terrified of the Caribs. In fact, the last group of Caribs to be killed were 11 different tribes in the area on the coast of which is now called Texas. Carib, in their language, is man-eater. And the, the sea they terrorized for centuries was called the Caribbean, the sea of man-eaters, the Caribbean. And when Columbus came with rumored about of who these rescuers were, see, you don't get that in public school. They rescued islanders. They didn't exterminate them. Columbus said when coming to one people group, he says, they have no religion, nor are they idolatrous, except that they all believe power and goodness to be in heaven. They firmly believe that I, with my ships and men, came from heaven. And with with this idea, I have been received everywhere. 
Since they lost fear of me, they are, however, far from being ignorant. That was the letter he wrote to the king of Spain. Because part of Columbus's mission was to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? And many times he reported back to the king and said, these people have a greater morality and a greater love for God than we do in Europe. What does that mean? It goes exactly in line with what we're talking about today, that it's God's will that you and I experience the salvation that comes from heaven. Even a people naked, walking around tropical islands of the Caribbean, the man-eating sea, understood that there's a heaven where good things come from. And even Columbus himself said, without the preaching of the gospel, they were not ignorant of that. Church, in our scripture reading together, we're going to be talking about heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll begin in verse 3. We'll go down to verse 9. I'll begin in verse 3. If you'll pick it up on the screens with verse 4, nice and loud, so hell and heaven can hear us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation or the coming of Jesus Christ. And I'll end this section with verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. To the screens, 2 Timothy 3, I'll begin in verse 1. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like this. Now, Luke chapter 21, Luke 21, I'll begin in verse 29. Luke 21, 29, eyes to the screen. Then Jesus spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. So you also, when you see these things beginning or happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with the crowds of drunkenness and fears of this life, and that they come on you unexpectedly. For, will, it will come up, uh, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Powerful portions of scripture there for us. Heaven, you, kept by the power of God. The Lord Jesus coming to get us. The promise of him in judgment. 
the glorious confidence that God's word tells us that before his wrath comes upon the earth, we might be able to seek his face and pray and be ready that we might escape that time of God's global worldwide judgment against all wickedness called the tribulation period. That is for a study of future Sundays that's ahead of us. Right now, we're looking at heaven, and we're asking the question, will you go there? Will you go there? And the first thing that we want to lay out before you today, by the way, you can take a deep breath and relax. This ought to excite you, the approach that we'll be looking at today regarding that question. Last week was last week's challenge by design. I deliberately gave the message last week how it was and what it was, not this one first. There's a reason for this. When asked the question, heaven, will you be going there? The answer should be number one in your note taking is yes. You need to be able to say yes to this. And this is the reason why. Yes, because you believe in him. Church, will you mark that down? I want to hit this and I want to hit it hard for this reason. It is absolutely overwhelmingly assured that the man or woman, boy or girl, who believes on and in the Lord Jesus Christ they're going to go to heaven. But we need to understand what believe or believing really means. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, the Bible says, so they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. That's the jailer in that famous moment where Paul and Silas and the ministry team were gathered together. You know the story. They were singing songs of praise while they're shackled in stocks. At midnight, an earthquake hit. I think it was an angel quake, by the way. It was an earthquake. I think an angel did all that because of what happens later. But uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that one of the jail keepers were terrified as to what was going on. And uh, his basic expression was, uh, I need to be saved. And the Bible response is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But today you and I live in a world that just uh, thinks that belief is just something where we assign a level of uh, attention to something uh, that we, we all believe in. We, we believe in this, we believe in that, and oh yeah, I'm, I'll believe in Jesus. But it's more than that. It's not difficult it's not rocket science. Listen, the belief that God expects from you who are going to heaven is a belief that is so precious that a child can believe in God. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that God is, I think, most encouraged by the belief or faith of a child. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, we need to become like little children before we can enter the kingdom of God. Belief, believing. The word means this, and you might care to make note of it. It means uh, to entrust. It means to commit. It, it means to um, believe in such a way that your belief is uh, to depend upon. So when we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, listen, are you going to go to heaven? Yes. Why is that true? Because you depend upon Jesus. That's the believer. That's the one that's going to be going to heaven. And if you've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you understand that he is Lord, Savior, God, he's Messiah, he died on the cross, he rose again from the dead. If Christ has become, I have to underline the word become, if Christ has become your passion, because that's how it really is. The more you fall in love with somebody, the more they become your passion your uh, focal point of your passion, of your attention. And that's good. That's, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. All the best when it comes to God. All the best when it comes to Jesus, to love him. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But what does it mean to believe in him? The reason why you're going to go to heaven is because you trust him. When you hear the things that are going on around the world and when you hear how you're not hearing things that are going on around the world because it's being kept from you. That raises a level of anxiety, that raises a level of threat to your peace and for your safety. And all of a sudden, what we as a culture, uh, in the First Amendment type of culture, we are threatened by that. Americans have more to lose than any other nation on earth right now. 
And that, that, that may encroach upon you and bring fear. Wait a minute. You're going to heaven. And because you're going to heaven, you've trusted in Jesus Christ. You believe him and what he has done in your life. Amen. You can entrust your future today to him. Amen. He will take care of you. Listen, you may or may not doubt that. We may or may not doubt that from time to time. We all have our moments and our seasons of faith and the challenge of faith. Every single one of them. We all go through this. All of us go through this, people. Don't think that you having doubt this morning is, is, because, is because you're not a Christian. That is not true. Every human, the greatest saints of God, I love reading them, have gone through horrific battles of doubt. George Whitfield, the Wesleys, Charles Spurgeon, Charles Finney, John the Baptist, great seasons of doubt. Listen, you've got to have belief in Christ before you can suffer seasons of doubt. In that order, cheer up. Don't lose heart. Heaven, will you be going there? The answer is absolutely yes if you're believing in Jesus Christ. But we want to make sure that we are truly believing him. There's a firm warning in the Bible about belief only is what I would say. Belief only. You said, Jack, didn't you just say a moment ago from the book of Acts, believe in the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved? Oh, yeah, yeah, that is, and that is true. But there's a belief only danger. You see, what do you mean? To believe is where you begin. And when you really begin by believing in Jesus Christ, that belief takes you somewhere. Never think for a moment that just because I accepted Christ on Monday night, just before 9 p.m., June 20th, 1977, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, uh, Greg Laurie preaching the gospel, Revelation chapter 20, Keith Green doing the worship that night. Just because I came to believe in Christ that night, if I would have walked away after going forward and never picked up the Bible again and never had a passion or a desire to know the one I claimed to have fallen in love with that morning, moment, then my belief would have been void and with no effect. Are you with me? It would have been nothing. To believe is the first step of a journey called sanctification where God brings you all the way through until you breathe your last breath or you hear a trumpet blast. For the Christian that is alive and well and possessed by the Holy Spirit, there is no downtime in our world. We, you and I, we have been deployed into a godless, Christless age to tell everyone we can about the love of God and the forgiveness that's in Jesus Christ. The question is, do you believe in him? James tells us this strong warning. James chapter 2, verse 19. He says, you believe that there's one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Satan believes in Jesus Christ, but Satan doesn't believe in Jesus Christ to save him. Satan knows of Jesus' authority, but he doesn't bow the knee. That will happen later. And I think, according to the Bible, you and I are going to watch Satan bow his knee. That's going to be a great day. That's going to be a great day. So number one, church, yes, yes, you're going to go to heaven if the fact that you believe in him as you ought. So yes, you believe because he's come to you. I want you to write that down. He has come to you. Pastor Jack, I do believe in Jesus. Yes, that is true because he has come to you. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, but the Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is awesome, people. The fact that you're going to go to heaven is based upon the foundational truth that Christ has come to you. He's the one that reached out to you. Number one, for this reason, he is not willing that you should perish, but that you should come to the knowledge of everlasting life. By the way, that's his desire for all people. We talked about that last week in a small degree. The fact is this, church, that believing in him is based upon this act of repentance. You see, People will say, I believe in Jesus, but there's been no change in their life. Why? They never repented. They're like the devils. The devils believe in Jesus. In fact, they're not. No, I take that back. They're not like the devils who believe. That's not even fair to the devils, demons, to say that. I'll tell you the reason why. 
The word I read a moment ago in James, it says that the devil or demons or Satan believes and trembles. Do you know what the word tremble is? The word tremble in the Greek is where we get our word goose flesh. Goose skin. You say goose skin. Yeah, I know we don't really think like that, but have you ever seen a naked turkey? Exactly. When you pluck that turkey, wait, we don't pluck turkeys. Somebody else plucks them. When we go down to the store and bring them home and unwrap them from the plastic, and you run your hand over the breast or the skin of the turkey, have you noticed that? Is it all lumpy? That's what the Bible says in the, in the book of James. When Satan thinks about God, his skin goes, <laughs> he gets goose skin. Oh, oh, people don't do that. People are brazen. They don't believe in God. They mock God. We read a moment ago how there's a generation of people as we approach the end, they'll be mockers of God. They don't get goose flesh. And yet hell has a respect for Christ like the godless of this world do not. Oh, but you who believe in him, you're going to heaven. You who believe in him, he's going to see to it. Listen, you don't hear this very often. Because most often, you know, you need to commit your life to Christ. You need to commit your life. I get it. The reason why that's true is because he has first committed himself to you. Think of that. And that's true. Because he has come to you. And I want some of you to think, stop and think right now, how that happened in your life. How did he come to you? Refresh your memory. Go back. Slow down. Rethink. Go back to the ancient paths. Retrace them in the early days of how Christ spoke to you. Where were you? What did he say? What were you thinking? When you began to awaken to his stimulating overtures to you as he began to draw you, Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father. It's interesting, by the way. It's, it's referenced really in two ways of Scripture. Jesus said, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws them to me. And Jesus also mentions that nobody can come to me unless the Spirit of God is at work in their lives. I kind of like to look at it this way. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, working in the world, working in your life to bring you to the one who saves you. The Bible says there's one mediator, go between. There's one negotiator between man, that's us, and God, and that is the mediator, Christ Jesus. Amen. He's pulling. I like to think of it this way. He's got, a, he's got a lost humanity, right? And represented on, by the work of the Holy Spirit on this hand. It's the Holy Spirit convicting people, which is almost illegal today. Think of it. If I say something today that Google doesn't like... Facebook doesn't like, if YouTube doesn't like, if I say something that is counterculture and their algorithm detects the words I'm using, it will block me out. We are not far from when I say you say something from the word of God with all love to reach someone with the gospel of salvation to bring them out of the grips of hell into heaven. Where this age of censorship steps in and says, you can't talk like that. We're going to sue you. We're going to shut you down. What are you really saying? This is what they're saying, but they don't know how to say it. We are going to shoot you the messenger because what you said, that message, affected that person. And we heard about it. Translation, we are going to legislate the work of the Holy Spirit till the point that it's illegal. Did you, what, when he said that, did you feel odd? Yes, I did. That odd feeling was the Holy Spirit saying, you need Christ. Amen. You need Jesus. You need hope, love, salvation, forgiveness. You need mercy. And someone who's rejecting Christ says, I felt offended. I felt threatened by their words. And a godless age will come in and begin to sue the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? In fact, they didn't even like what I just said just now. <laughs> if you think about it. Remembering. You say, I thought we were going to be talking about future things. This, this is exactly what we're doing. 
That's why we're taking this as a whole series. Because salvation is the greatest prophetic doctrine of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 9. In fact, you're going to recognize this. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. This is awesome. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The Bible says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You ever heard that before? You probably didn't recognize Isaiah 9, 2. Next verse, you guys, this is the reason why you, you, you recognized the hearing of it. You didn't recognize their scripture reference. This is what you recognized. Matthew 4, 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John, that's John the Baptist, had been put in prison, Jesus departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, Sea of Galilee, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. You don't care about that unless you're Jewish, friends. That, those two locations just got your Jewish attention. By the way, Matthew, anybody remember Matthew's last name? Matthew Levi, he's a Jew. I encouraged a friend of mine the other day, I said, you need to read uh, the New Testament. He said, it's, uh, I'm not going to read a Gentile book. I said, uh, did you know it's written by a bunch of Jews? <laughs> I did. Verse 14, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is dawn. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, what, what did he say? <laughs> Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's believing. Listen, when the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, Christian, and you've sensed, I don't know if God speaks to me. Well, listen, the next time you do something wrong, unplanned or planned, you do something wrong, you will hear him speak. I don't know if God ever talks to me. Mm, if you do something wrong, think something wrong, do you not hear him speak? Yes, yes he does. Every Christian should say, I hear him speak. What you really want to do is be able to say, I read the Bible a lot. God speaks to me from the word. I don't get in trouble much, but when I do, boy, do I hear him speak. <laughs> what you don't want to do is walk around as a Christian and say, God spoke to me today. He only spoke to me twice today. He spoke to me five times today. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh, he's faithful to convict. He's faithful to speak. All of God's kids, the Bible says, God will never discipline a child that's not his own. He only disciplines his own kids. You don't spank your neighbor's kids. You go to jail. I mean, you want to. The little creep is messing things up. Best you can do is say, go home. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You can't spank, it. You can't spank kids that are not yours. I say, Pastor, I don't know if you should say spank. Discipline then. The Bible says nothing. It's a, what's another story? That's a whole nother day. God disciplines his kids because he loves them. If you don't love your kid, it's, it's lived out because you don't correct them. You just leave the little rats to do whatever they want. Nobody wants them around because you've raised up a little maniac, right? Because they've been left to himself. The Bible says you leave. This has nothing to do with this message. This is just side note. That if you don't discipline your child in love, for crying out loud, if you love them, you're going to tell them, don't do that again. You're going to wind up in jail someday. You teach them. Listen, the Bible tells you, if you don't do that, the Bible says that kid will grow up and be a reproach to his mother. You know, dads have a hard time. It's like, you know what? That rotten kid turned out to be a piece of junk. I'd like to... Men are just... The moms, no matter what, the moms, they just weep from the inside out. It's a heartbreak. And I don't know how I... <laughs> went down that, but it's... But it, repentance is required if we're really going to believe. And that's why many of you, many of us, we get the sting of the Holy Spirit. Because listen, he calls us to repentance because we are his kids. There are those who are becoming God's children because they are going to repent of their sins. God knows who, who they are. And there are us who are in the family that when we sin, the Bible tells us if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from, un, from all unrighteousness. What's that all about? God will convince 
convict you and I to maintain fellowship with us. If we don't repent as a, as a believer to our Heavenly Father, then we're still in the family. God doesn't believe in abortion. You're not losing your salvation. He just won't talk to you. Can you imagine if your little kid came up and said after you know, slapping the dog and, and, and burning his bicycle or something, and then he comes up, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's quarantined to his room. You go to your room, you stay there all day, you're in trouble. And then the kid comes out, coming down the hallway, and the kid walks up. Remember, he's under, he's under the sentence of, you're in trouble. But he comes and says, Mom, Mom, Dad, I know I'm supposed to be in my room, but can I talk to you about what I want for Christmas? <laughs> you know what Mom and Dad are going to do? They're going to say, no, I'm not talking to you. Get back to your room. Repentance is the key that keeps or restores or brings about fellowship with God. It's got to happen. The second thing is this. Yes, because you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to be going to heaven. Because listen, he's begun a work in you. Oh, for those of you, listen, that maybe think that You've gone too far. Maybe God has given up on you and you're thinking thoughts of condemnation. You need to remember again, Romans chapter eight, verse one, that there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You remember that. You're gonna go to heaven, friend, because listen, did God not create a work in you? Didn't he begin a work in you? Can you look back? And maybe you're listening right now and you just think it's all over for you. And just out of curiosity, you've stepped in here today or you've tuned in today and you think, it's all over for me. I wanna ask you this question. Did God ever begin a work in your life? I do believe that if this question is answered, there will not be enough churches in America to house the prodigal sons and daughters that can make their way back home today. You think the church is big in America? You think this church is big? This is, a, this is ridiculous. I, I believe there are more condemned brothers and sisters who are walking around with a scarlet letter, as it were, on their forehead, thinking that they could never go back to church because Satan has lied to them. They're not happy in the world. Listen, is this you? You're not happy in the world because you know better but you feel as though Jesus doesn't want you back and you're in no man's land. That is Satan's language. That's how Satan talks. And you get up every day with a cloud over your head in life. David lived like that for about a year. I think it was a year after he had murdered Bathsheba's husband, after he got her pregnant. So who are you talking about? Oh, some renegade. Some murderer. Some adulterer named King David. A man after God's own heart. Hmm. He repented and he turned. And God welcomed him back into the family. If this last year that's passed taught us anything, and if the opening days of this year has taught us anything, you better come back to Jesus quick. Amen. Friend, if you, are, if you somehow ostracized yourself from the family of God, you better come back. You better hurry back. Listen, if you can't find a church with the doors open, catch a train, stick your thumb out, hitchhike if you have to, get somewhere. Amen. Get somewhere to run into the house of God and set up a, and if you can't do that, go find something. I'm, I'm really big on what I'm about to say. It's not necessary, but I like places. What I mean by that is I like to make places special between me and God. You guys all know about the oak tree. I own that oak tree. That oak tree that the city has on their city emblem, I found it before the city ever found it. I lived here before the city was here. That was my oak tree. It's gigantic. You got to climb a hill to get to it. It's epic. It's amazing. And I've got a lot of prayer time at that oak tree. There were times of dedication. Listen, in 19... 
86, I stood on that hilltop with my family, holding them in our hands and, and st stretching out our hands all over this valley and beyond the mountains. And we didn't even know what we were saying, but we said it. Dear God in heaven, for whatever purposes you've moved us to this unbelievable distant land, we can't smell salt water, we can't hear any waves. What's up with this? And we stretched our hands out over this valley and beyond. And we said, Lord, if it's your will, deliver this valley and beyond into your hands. And I didn't know how he was going to do that. I didn't, I didn't even think he was going to do that. We just had this weird thought in the moment. And every time I see a city vehicle or a cop car go by, I don't see anybody but that tree on the side of that car, that, that logo. It's like, that's my tree. I took a group of men not too long ago. Where's, right? Didn't we go up there? We went up there and we held our hands up like we did in 1986. And I dedicated a group of men of this church to God's hand. And by the way, those men are deployed all around you. And they're on a mission. That mission that they're on is to be masculine, God-loving, wife, children-loving men as examples. And they are going to transform this church. This is going to be a church, listen, this is going to be a church of the most amazing biblical masculinity you've ever seen. You say, oh, can you say that word? Can you say masculinity? Oh, God invented masculinity. The problem is the world has shown you a horrible picture of it. Not, not toxic masculinity, anointed masculinity. Jesus taught us how to love. Jesus taught us how to defend truth and to care for others. Can you ask yourself if God has done a work in you? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible tells us, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. This is awesome. The Lord knows those who are his. Oh, come on. This last week, I was in Washington, D.C., for various things, and one of them for a few hours went over and stood uh, in the massive crowd of rally uh, protesters there on the mall, and it was interesting to see that there were some people there from all kinds of walks of life, and by the way, I don't care what you're watching on the news, I was there, okay? There were definitely a handful of people who infiltrated that rally, and I watched it. By the way, I took some pictures, too, and sent it to the cops. Yeah. But what was amazing was you could, you could see people who were, um, I saw a lot of people who were tattooed. And I'm not going to endorse or condemn tattoos. I'm just going to say that you could tell, you could tell that that guy was a Harley Davidson fan. <laughs> Are you with me? You could tell that that guy was a New York Giants fan. Okay? Um, you could tell that that person fill in the blank. How did I know? Because they had tattoos in the back of their neck and on their arms and hands. They were marked. Are you with me? Yes. I saw it. Yes. Guess what? To those of you who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God sees your mark. Amen. We can't see it physically. God can see that you're marked. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, we'll talk about it soon, I think, in a moment, if I get to it in time, that you who believe are sealed with and by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there's no getting around that. Listen, today, if you say, I don't know if I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit, either, either you're not and you need to get, or you are and you don't know how to identify that. And that's okay. But the Lord knows those who are his. The word in Greek is gnosko. It's a great word. I love this word because the word, listen, the Lord experiences those who are his. That's what the word gnosko means. It means, it means, you see this? Watch, watch. Listen. Bible. Turn the pages. You know what I'm doing? I'm gnoscoing this Bible. I'm familiar with it. I feel it. I am in direct connection with it. 
God's word says, I know those that are mine. I'm in direct connection with them. I feel them. I can touch them. I know them. I cannot be any more intimate with them than what I am with my own. Do you believe in Lord Jesus Christ? That's your reality. You need to spiritually stop tiptoeing around and be confident in Christ. Here's a big test. You ever want to try this? Do it at home. Don't do it here. If you don't think you belong to God, if you think God doesn't want you, try denouncing him. Take your Bible when you go home today. Go get a trash can and try to burn it. Just burn it. Just throw your Bible across the street. Just say, I never pick it up again. I did that once. You're looking at a guy that struggled for three years with such condemnation because I couldn't get over my past. I remember being so angry because I couldn't fathom the love of God for me. How could he? What was funny is that I could see God's love for all of you and the friends around me at that time, but I couldn't see it for me. And it's powerful because that's a da- it's powerful because it's dangerous because Jesus is a personal savior. He's not a group savior. Amen. You need to hear this. If I were to ask you, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. And I asked you the diagnostic questions. Do you believe he died for you on the cross? Yes. But do you believe, but, uh, then you believe you're going to heaven, right? I don't know. I'm just such, I don't know. I keep remembering about my past. And it's just, uh, I don't know. Listen, you need to understand something. He died for you personally. That's why it had to be God that did it. No man could have done it for us personally. Do you understand that? Yes. So, hey, I found a really great guy. He's down the street. As far as I can tell, he could almost walk on water. Maybe he'll die for me. (laughs) Hey, even if you found such a person, it's not going to work. God had to die for us. And when you come to realize that, that if, if Adam and Eve had a baby, somebody, give, give me your names, just give me a name. Jennifer. Jennifer. If Adam and Eve had a baby, and Jennifer was the only one born, and then Eve trips over an apple over there, it had to be an apple. The way Apple computer, Apple, <laughs> it had to be an apple. If Adam and Eve would have sinned and plunged the three of them, by their action into condemnation, Jesus Christ still would have died if Jennifer would have been the only kid born into this entire world. Did you know that? Say, whoa, that's not a very big salvation purchase for all that suffering. You're looking at it religiously. God looked at it, listen, listen, (laughs) listen to me. (laughs) So... God looked at it purely based on his nature of who he is. God didn't convince himself that he's the redeemer. Because he is redeemer. It's not that it was one or 100 billion people over the course of human history. It's irrelevant to him. He doesn't love based on numbers. He loves one at a time. And that love he has for you is blind to your sins and faults because you believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know why that do you know why you see red when you see something red? Because your brain, your eye is processing every color except one color. You know why the sky is blue? Because it's not blue. You know why you see red? Because that thing's not red. John, you have a red sweatshirt on. I think it's red. Okay, you forgot that. You shocked them. I do, I do. So here's, it's, oh, it's wild. My eyes, in the, in the spectrum of light, my eyes are processing all of the color, colors here. But you know what's, what's being rejected? His, what he's wearing The reason why it's that color to me is because every color of the spectrum is being absorbed except one color. What color is it? Red. Red is bouncing back and hitting my eye. Thus, I say it's red. 
it may not be red. The sky is not blue. The sky absorbs every color except blue. It spits blue back at you because it's not absorbing blue. Are you hearing me? When God looks at the Christian, the Bible says we've been washed in the blood of the... God sees everything he would have. You see, as a, as a non-Christian, God sees all of my sin. But the moment I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb, imagine you being, because of belief, you're dipped in a tub of blood. You see, Pastor, that's so gross. It should be gross. It costs God his life. And you stand up. I see, listen, if I were God and I'm looking at you, I only see red. That's why the Bible says he will, not, he, he will never remember your sins. And as far as the east is from the west, he will remove your sins from you. Why? Because he only sees red. <laughs> so who made that up? God did. Stop trying to convince him of other things. Just zip it, will you? Thank him for it. When you trust Christ, God sees you red, washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's his deal. Listen, he did that. Enter into that. You have nothing to do with it but to believe him. So get into it. Stop overthinking it. Did you do wrong? Did you sin against God? Was that evil? Yes. Then run to him. Amen. Run to him and get red. Amen. Plunge, as the old hymn goes, in under the fountain of Emmanuel's veins. Remarkable. Genesis Genesis 3, 14 and 15 says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat the dust uh, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity. Listen, God is speaking to Satan. I'm going to put warfare between you and the woman. That's funny. You mean God is like arranging a fight between Satan and Eve? Not exactly. More specifically, between your seed, Satan, your offspring, and her offspring. His offspring, plural, her offspring. That's why it's capital S. There. Singular. You will bruise, uh, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. You'll inflict pain upon this child that's coming that will redeem the world, but he's going to crush your head. Satan's knew, Satan has known that since the Garden of Eden. But has God begun to work in you? Well, why don't you let him finish it? It's time, to, it's time to stop goofing off. Let him finish it. You're going to heaven. Why not go there in blazing glory? <laughs> Do you believe him? Yes. Do you believe that his word is given to you, the word of God? Yes. Then stand up, wipe your nose, and get going. Amen. Stop looking back. Every time you look back, you crash. I don't care if you're driving your lawnmower, <laughs> driving your lawnmower. pushing your lawnmower, if you're sailing your boat, if you're driving down the freeway, you know the faster you go, and are we not going fast in life right now? Yeah. The faster you go down the freeway, I don't care if you're in a Yugo or a Ferrari, the, 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 the truth is the same. If you look over your shoulder to look back, you're going to crash. Yeah. That's why you have rearview mirrors. You don't look back. Amen. A lot of Christians today are going to heaven, but they're stuck because they keep looking back. Yeah. Oh, God, remember this? And God goes, no, all I see is red. Yeah, it was really bad. Remember I said that thing? Uh, no, I just see red. <laughs> Psalm 138, verse 8, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. That's his prayer. Here's the reality. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Listen to this, everybody. You guys okay? Yes. Ephesians 1, 3. Listen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, in Christ. 
just as he chose us in him, that's Jesus, before the foundation of the world. That means God knew you before you were ever hatched. He knew who you were. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us. He did that based on his foreknowledge. This should encourage you, believer, who's going to heaven. To adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in, notice capital B, the beloved. That's Jesus. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom, prudence, having made known to us, here it comes, the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Hear all these, this legal talk? It's as though God is making a declaration, an executive order from God, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven, which are on earth, in him, verse 11 says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Is this genius or what? Verse 12, that we should first, that we who first, there it is, trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Wow! You meditate on, that's deep. That's beyond deep. That's, letting you into to the secret or the mystery of salvation that was in the heart and mind of God before time ever was. Philippians 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, 6 tells us, be, technically, the Greek is be being. We say being confident of this very thing. The, the, the word in the Greek means be being confident. Always, never, never, never do you... Not have to be confident. It's a, it's a command. Be being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. That means God does his work. Are you going to heaven? Well, I'm not sure. Do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Yes. I just don't feel saved. Stop it. And believe. Go back to what you know. What got you originally to raise your hand or to get up or come forward or to fall on your face or to say, Jesus, come into my life and save me from myself. Wash me clean of my sins and cause me to walk with you. And if you prayed that 10, 20, 30 years ago and you've been like a pinball machine ever since, by God's grace and mercy, you're hearing this message today and you can stop being like that game, that toy and receive this message from the Lord today that he wants you and he will make up for all the time that has been wasted and then finally this is the final push it's going to take me a few minutes to give you this final thing but yes you're going to go to heaven because he has spoken life to you this is the absolute come on let's be honest man this is, this is why we love God he speaks to us the things that we need to hear. When a, when a wife wants to hear her husband say, I love you more than anything in the whole world. That's, she wants to hear that. If she says, honey, do you love me? And he says, I pay the bills, don't I? That's, that's sad. That's sad. That's sad. The amazing thing what God has done. God did it all. And then we ask him, do you love me? And he says, yes. And, if, and whenever you doubt it, Jack, just look back at what I've done for you in the past. Go back to the cross. You know what? If you doubt it, read the gospels again. And, and you'll see what I did because I'm crazy about you, Jack. You see, I just can't handle the love of God. Well, listen, he's begun a good work in you. You're a little stubborn, I get it. Just start here then. God likes you. <laughs> That's a good place to start. I can't handle the love of God. Well, then, you know what? He likes you. Start there. See, so what does that mean? That means he wants to hang out with you today. 
That's good news. Most people don't. He does. Right? Think of it. I'm glad he loves me. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Who's the minds, the God of this age, Satan is blinded, who do not believe. See that? Lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Wow. Last verse, it's a whopper. You guys can stand even. See, if you stand at your expense, it will remind me that I got to end soon. <laughs> I'll feel sorry for you. This, but this is a whopper. We'll look at it together. It's Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Watch this. By the way, before I read it, Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts as we read this word, this word that you spoke. Technically, really, those words should be written in red because they're words that you spoke and you speak and they're eternal. And we ask you, Father, that you would allow us to see our own hearts right now. On the same day that Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, a great multitude or multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And then he spoke many things to them in parables, parables, parabolos, para alongside, parabolos, to cast truth alongside every head, every heart of every listener. He just threw out the truth and it landed like a, like a bobber on a fishing line right alongside each person's head. Para alongside, balos to cast, truth alongside their head. Notice, he didn't force it into their heart. He didn't shove it down their throat. He cast it alongside them. He's cast it alongside us. This is what he said. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some, that is seed, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and said to him, and they're going to be asking him this, why do you speak to the people, them, in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. Stop right there, verse 12. Listen, he's not withholding the truth from them. Satan blinds the eyes of those who do not believe. Jesus throws out in preaching, he throws out the truth to all, but not all accept. That's how you know who is in the family and who's not. Oh, I wish pastors across America would get this down. They don't need to apologize for the Bible and avoid portions of the Bible. If they're really pastors, they're supposed to give the Bible and let Jesus do his work. You don't make, you don't make a church happen. You just, you're just supposed to do one thing, Pastor, and you're just supposed to give them the truth faithfully. And God does the rest. If you, if you try to build a church, you'll never build a church. You'll build a clubhouse, but you won't build a church. Let him build it, and he uses his word to do it. You just give the word, and he takes care of the rest. For whoever has, to him more will be given, more light, more light, more light. The more open you're to the light, the more light you're going to get. He will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecies of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. No, who closed their eyes? 
they, but in their conjunction and their unbelief with Satan. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, the Bible being preached, and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what is sown in their hearts. This is he who received by the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world. 2020. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, thank you for saving us at the cross of Christ, and thank you for leaving us an empty tomb. Thank you for your word. And today, Father, I pray that those who even now have been ministered by your Holy Spirit, that they would breathe deep, filling up their lungs with air. If they expand their chest for the first time in years, perhaps for some, they would take you at your word and that they would remember that you began to work in them. You will not forsake it because that's true. They will no longer delay. They will obey. And with that, the joy of the Lord will be their strength. And they will go forth from this place today, bearing precious seed. How beautiful are the feet of those who go and distribute your truth to the world. So Father, baptize this church, baptize this service in the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord God, any man or woman, boy or girl, who is outside the kingdom, that you'd intensify their state, their condition, that they might run and say, what must I do to be saved? And the shout would come from us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Well, hey, thanks for listening and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age, us being together and linking up together to get the word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button, tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're gonna continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us, no pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon. I'm going to ask you to stand tonight and um, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Um, long time in this chapter, but it's so incredibly powerful theology. Hebrews chapter 6. We move on, though, into this section that, uh, for me, I've titled it Wheels Up. Wheels up, it means, okay, we just went through all of that. What the author of the book of Hebrews was saying regarding moving on from those basic elements of the understanding, which by the way, when you look at the opening throws of chapter five and six, the word is said that we're gonna now move on from those basic things of Christianity. And he mentions the basic things of Christianity. And if you look at them, things like the coming judgment, things like the laying on of hands, things like baptisms, things like, and he announces, 
key doctrines of God, that there's so many of those things today that are basics in the Bible, they would be top shelf uh, things that some churches might never get to. That's how far I think the church has drifted from its orthodoxy and its origins. So when we talk about wills up right now in this portion of scripture, we're talking about getting off the ground, taking off, getting off the ground, and getting into the heavens. Where we belong, by the way. Somebody might say, well, you know, pastor, be careful. We can become so heavenly minded, you know, that we're no earthly good. Oh, I wish that was our problem. (laughs) That would be a great problem to have. So I'll begin, if you would, in verse 7, if you'll pick it up in verse 8. Together we read, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But beloved, listen to this now, by the way, with all that we've gone through over the course of these last four or five weeks in Hebrews, now look at verse nine. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Wonderful. Verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. And so, Father, tonight we pray right now, tonight. Somebody might say in this gathering, I don't have an inheritance. (laughs) Well, maybe in this world we don't. But in heaven, in the world to come, what has been promised to us, what you have purchased for us at the cross, hallelujah, that there's no market swing that can change it. There's no thief that can steal it. There's no rust that could rot it. There's nothing that can consume it. It's safe in, in your heaven, in your kingdom, before your throne. Our salvation is secure in Christ. And we will be saved only as long as Jesus lives. And hallelujah, that will be forever. So thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. And that's not a risky prayer to pray. Is there a limit to us being saved? Well, I guess if you connect it to the fact that you're only safe and saved so long as your great high priest lives. And glory be to God that our great high priest is no one that originated on earth. (laughs) He came from heaven and he became as the book of Hebrews tells us, our great high priest. So as we get into this church, wheels up, we start with this right here, and that is that you and I, we are on our way to greater glory. Please write that down. We are on our way as believers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, to greater glory. Heaven. We should talk about heaven more often. I don't know why I don't. I don't know why we don't, but think about it. If you have scheduled a trip, do you have any trips planned? Do you have a vacation scheduled? You, you thought about it, you, you, you saved, or you're saving for it, or you're getting excited, you look and, oh my goodness, two more months, oh, one more month, two more days, and you're, what? It's a vacation, and you look forward to that. Listen, as Christians, we should be talking about heaven like that. We're going to be there forever. It's going to answer everything we've ever needed and wanted and yearned for. And we won't, listen, we won't be praying to Jesus in heaven. Did you know that? Oh, by the way, there'll be no Bible studies in heaven. You're going to know it all. You know it all. You're going to know it all. And you won't be praying to Jesus. You'll be talking to Jesus. (laughs) If you have a question, just go and ask him. And that in between talking to Noah, I want to talk to Adam. What were you thinking? (laughs) Go over to Eve and say, I forgive you. 
<laughs> you know, whatever it might be. It's just heaven. We don't, have, we don't think about it enough. It's been often said that those who have had heaven in the forefront of their thinking have done the most for those here on earth. I think that's a good word. And heaven ought to drive so much of what you and I do, if not everything that you and I do. So there's no doubt about it that when we talk about wheels up as a believer, of course we look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus, but even if we were all to die of old age, do you know how soon that will be? Think about, think about right now. You know, I'm Pastor, I'm only 20 years old. Yeah, good for you. Here's the thing. Have you noticed, by the way, do you remember when you were young and time seemed to drag? It was very, very demonic though. Listen, <laughs> summers, summers went by and it felt like two weeks. Yeah. Summer was over. Now back in those days when, when there was reason and logic on earth, everybody in the nation had three months off in public school at the same time. And it was awesome. And, um, but those summers went by so fast. And then school started. And then you're thinking, oh, Lord, please, may the school year go by as fast as summer did. <laughs> did that happen? No. It's like Satan's up there playing with some clock someplace. And uh, the whole school year seemed like it lasted four years, one year, nine months. It was horrible. And um, you think about how timing works and where we are in, this, in the age of our lives, and you may be just really feeling it, you know, I'm just young and I'm going to take on the world, and yeah, you go, that's great. But just know this, you're going to, it seems to me about 21, I, w I got married at, tw I think I was 21, maybe 20, 20, something like that, 21-ish, and um, and then uh, time started f flying. And then several years later, we had some babies. And then, then a, a, a whole 12 months felt like six months. And now at the age that I'm at right now, I'm feeling like we're in February, maybe February. But we're almost halfway through the year. You, can someone say amen to what I'm talking about? It's so weird that as you get older, time just goes by so much faster. When you're young, I had a general, a U.S. Army general tell me, he said, one of the policies of warfare is as old as the earth. And he said, it's this. You never see a general, except Washington did this, but you, generals do not go out to battle out to the front lines. They're back they did that before they survived. They're back in the command center sipping coffee and watching the battle unfold while you send 19-year-olds out to the front lines. You want to know why? For a lot of reasons. But one of them is a 19-year-old doesn't believe that he's going to die. Did you know that? They don't think they're going to die. You have a sense that you're invincible. And um, it's an amazing thing. As a believer, no matter what your age is, know this that it maybe wheels up for us to fly into the heavens theologically, but when we do land, it's going to be in heaven. That's where we're going to go down. We're not going to go down in the Amazon. We're not going to go down in the Atlantic. We're going we're to land in heaven, and God will see to it. The first thing that we see, you guys, is in verses 7 and 8, and it's this, that this glory that we're talking about, it's a very practical glory. And he says here in verse 7, for the earth which drinks in the rain, we know a little bit about that, thank God, in California now, that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated. The rain comes down, the earth produces the nutrients, the rain, the soil get together and produces a crop. And the person or those who cultivate it benefit from that. They receive blessings from God. We take that for granted, do we not? I think that's gonna, I think we're gonna be very thankful in the, in the future for whatever we have to eat, the way things, you know, are going. But verse 80 says, but if it bears thorns and briars, 
It's rejected. Can't eat that. Can't enjoy that. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, there, this, this rejection of a failed crop, so to speak, is near to being cursed. And the second thing is, uh, its end is being burned. So he's issuing this, that as a believer, how should our lives be uh, marked? How should we be graded if we're going to do that? Now, don't take that the wrong way. When it comes to salvation, there's no grade. You're either saved or you're not. You're not, I'm almost saved. I'll give me a few more weeks. That's not how it works. You're either born again and your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life and you're going to heaven because you believe Jesus died for your sins and that he rose again from the dead for your justification, that those two realities start in your life a real thing called sanctification. Sanctification is when the Holy Spirit goes to work inside the life of a real believer and the book of Hebrews has been teaching this. And he starts a work that he will never stop until the day you meet Jesus. And that is called sanctification. So, well, sanctification, what is that? Simply this, that he works every day in your day-to-day -day life to get you to be reflecting more of the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's the only one who can do that. You cannot do that. A five-step program to being righteous cannot do that. It's got to be you and I understanding that what awaits us is glory. We're going to heaven, and it's going to be absolutely awesome in the process of that time. Until we get there, the Holy Spirit rolls up his sleeve, so to speak, and yours too. And as it were lives out through you. It's called, it's called Christianity. The reason why I avoid using the term Christianity so often is because you see so much that is called Christianity that's not Christianity. But I like to think of it this way. Um, some of you are aware, some of you have seen this. If not, look it up later, not now. But uh, the U.S. Uh, military has developed the exoskeleton soldier. It's pretty awesome. And that is where a soldier just uh, steps inside of this um, coating. It kind of wraps around. Most of it's on, his, on the back end of, of his body and covers him. And there's a, like a little bit of a shield. So he kind of goes into this half, you know, like this halfway shell, so to speak, right? Uh, gets strapped in and um, he can run for hours at 30, 35 miles an hour. He can uh, pick up a 200 pound concrete block and stand and hold it like this and set it right back down. Um, he, can move, he can punch or he can throw and just break things in half. The skeleton, this machine is on the outside of your human body. Think of that in reverse, where that exoskeleton, so to speak, is actually internally inside of you. Take all of that power and all of that strength and imagine that inside of you. You look normal. There's no external things attached to you. True Christianity is the Holy Spirit, as it were, inside of you by his power living his life out through you. In fact, the more that, I know this sounds crazy, but the more that you and I relax, the more he's in control, the better it is. The more that you and I stop trying to do it our way, the more he gets to do it his way. Uh, listen, when we give up worrying about stuff, then he's free to take over those things. And we think, no, I can't do that, I can't do that. You know, like you get to the edge of the cliff or whatever it is, and you're supposed to jump. All your friends have jumped, so you, have a, you, have, you know you're going to jump because your friends have jumped. And you have enough pride where you know you're going to jump, but you don't want to jump. 
and you have a debate with yourself and you're arguing with yourself, just jump. Because any pause is torture. You ever see people go to the beach and the water's cold? If you ever see me go to the beach, uh, you will think, is, he, is there something wrong with him? You want to know why? Because if, if I'm at the beach and I want to go in the water, there's no doubt about it. I am going to go into the water, and I already know it's going to hurt. This is the Pacific, not the Atlantic. I mean, our water is cold. But I want to go in the water, so when I get, I just go. There's no... You know, you, <laughs> that's torture are you going to go in the water yes then go the, the clock's ticking and as a Christian time is like that are you going to go for it yes then go because far too many Christians are going like this <laughs> do you want God to use you I do I do then get out there I, I will I will Go! Watch what happens. It's crazy because the world jumps out of an airplane. They'll, t they'll strap a giant rubber band to their ankle and jump off a bridge. And a Christian goes, I don't, I don't know if I, sh I don't know if I can be an usher. And, and, you know, and then Saturday you're jumping off of a bridge with a rubber band tied to your foot. Right? Let the Spirit of God. Young people today, listen, learn this quick. Don't do Christianity. Let the Holy Spirit do it to you. He'll do it. He'll go to work in your life. It's a practical glory. We don't have to wait to get to heaven to see and to experience God, God's power in our lives. The more yielded you are, the more he takes over. It's amazing. None of us, if, you know, a friend of ours went into surgery, emergency surgery today, and... Um, Listen, I guarantee you this, it just happened, you know, that she was on vacation in Boston and she wound up going to one of the most renowned, which by, you would think by accident, we would say, she wound up going into the one most renowned hospitals in the world and had some of the best surgeons in the world uh, and all she was on vacation and she had a gallbladder attack or something. But, but here's the thing, she had, she, she told us, I got the best. I guarantee you, no part along that surgery did she get up and say, excuse me, are you guys really degreed? Where'd you go to school? She didn't turn to the surgeon and ask him to show his grades. God does it, or in this case, the surgeons do it. But he's in you. He's working within you. And so it announces to us that this is what God wants from our lives. He wants, as it were, the rain to fall down upon us into a soiled heart, not soiled as bad, heart of soil that is ready to receive what he gives so that it might produce beautiful, viable, life-giving nutrients. That's what God wants from our lives. He wants that for you. And we should want that for ourselves. Very practical. God wants your Christianity usable, practical, powerful. And he'll do that. And if you're, if you're today saying, well, I, I just don't see that happening. Don't say that too loud. Because you're confessing something about your own personal life. It's not that God's weak. What is it? Find out, friend. And no one's judging you, and I'm not judging you saying it. It's this. Find out what it is and get that cleared up. Because boy, does God have a great plan for you. Amen. People want to apologize. You know, God's got a wonderful plan for your life. People have made fun of that statement because it's like, sounds too soft. I'm not going to ever apologize for that. Never going to apologize for that. It's absolutely true. Give your sins to him. He gives you his righteousness. Amen. Give your weakness to him, Paul the Apostle taught us, and he gives us his strength. Amen. The moment you and I come to something that's impossible, I can never, so to speak, climb that mountain. God might just say to you, well, that's why I'm sending a helicopter to take you up there. <laughs> Our God's big, people. 
and he is awesome, and he's practical. Lisa and I went to the movies the other night, and I encourage everybody to see, um, I think it's called His Only Son. Have you seen it? Please go see it. Please go see it. Pay the money. It goes to a, a pay while it's in the theater, and it encourages those guys to keep making great movies. It's a great movie. I wouldn't have named it that. I think they blew a marketing opportunity personally because Christians would go see it anyway. I sat in the theater like this and Lisa said, would you just be quiet? Because I kept saying, There's, they blew the marketing moment. It's super well done and very, very powerful. Very, very biblically accurate. I'm very proud of whoever that kid was that made it. But... um. I said, it should, be, it should have been called Abraham. And she goes, oh, why? What, what's wrong with his only son? Because, only, because Christians know the only son line. We know that already. Yeah. What I want is Jewish people to go see it. If you're Jewish, you're not going to go see it. His only son. I don't believe what those guys believe. But if it was Abraham, every Jew in the nation would have gone to see it. Did I get that right? Yeah. Don't you see? If it's Abraham, the Jews are going to say, I'm going to go see it. That's our guy. And it's so good. But it's all about Abraham and his love for his son, his only son, that he's to be offered up on Mount Moriah. And at the end of the... Oh, shit. I won't say. Go see it. And you'll walk out saying, you're right, you're right. It should have been called Abraham. Because it's, it's the gospel message and they don't even mention the word gospel. They don't have to. It's played out. Listen, imagine if God in his practicality, because he moves so practically, he moved that way in the life of Abraham, the drama. We open up our Bible and it sounds like God's talking to Abraham every five minutes. But decades went by. Remember, God spoke to Abraham and then he didn't talk to him. So long, Sarah says, look, I don't know what's up. He's not talking to you. It's been forever. There's Hagar. <laughs> right? But that's how God is. Now, for us, he's given us, look, we live in the 21st century. We have his word printed. He's always speaking. It's powerful, practical God. I don't like this, but it's true, and then sometimes I love it, but he moves and says and acts his way, not the way I want him to. He's not a Santa Claus, he's not a puppet, he's not a, he's not a rabbit's foot, right? Well, I prayed to God, I pray, I, I've been praying for like three days and nothing happens. <laughs> what if God were to say to you, I'm not gonna answer your prayer for about seven years, because what you're asking for, either A, you're not ready for it, or that person or that moment's not ready for you. Amen. Can you handle that? Yeah. You know the family member that you've been praying for forever and you're afraid the rapture will take place because you're afraid they're lost? And you, 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 you say, oh, I want the Lord to come back, but my, my, my dad or my wife, they're not saved yet. You, did you know God knows that? <laughs> He's not like sweating that one out. But he's going to move in his time. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We've got to rest in the fact that he's practical. Secondly, church, mark this down if you would. It's this possessive glory. Possessive. It's not a word you hear often. But there's a possess possessive glory where in verse 9 it says, but beloved, he's talking to Believers, we are confident of better things concerning you. This is so encouraging. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Hey, you guys are saved. You guys are followers of Christ. You should expect something great to be happening in and through you throughout your entire life in God's timing. And so he says, we're confident of better things. What was he drawing the contrast to? You remember the previous verses of this chapter was those who start out believing 
and wind up saying, I don't think Jesus is really it after all. I'm going to go back to animal sacrifices. He says, I, basically, he's announcing, thank God, we're more confident concerning these things that accompany you and your salvation. Though we speak in this manner, verse 10, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Watch. In that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Number one, who's he talking to? Remember, he's talking to the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who came out of Judaism, he's talking to the Hebrew believers. Okay, you with me? So if you're Jewish here tonight, that's exactly who he's talking to. And of course, all of us as well. But at that moment, those of the Jewish community that came out of Judaism into a relationship with the Lord were starting to be persecuted. And so they began to wonder, gosh, it was a lot easier just being a Jew in the sense of Judaism following men's rules. Rabbi, tell me when to stand up. Rabbi, tell me when to sit down. Just tell me what to do. Friends, listen. There's no faith in that. It is easier. If you sign up for some religion or system that you pull out and you check the box, are you do this is what we do on Mondays. This is what we do on Tuesdays. Are you hearing me? There's no faith in that. But think about how you bless the heart of God. And I know you don't think you do, but when you get up in the morning or tonight when you lay down, whatever your regimen is, you know, we all have our routine whereby when you meet God, By you doing that, no one's putting a gun to your head. No one is, no one is ask, no one's gonna ask you, did you do this today for 20 minutes or half an hour, two days or whatever? It's gotta be a love thing Amen. with God. Amen. And that's the foundation to this incredible life that we live. I know it's tough, I know it's difficult, but you gotta remember We've got to live in such a way that it honors God because he has written our names in heaven. He has situated us in heaven. In, in a moment, we're going to come to a, a, a verse in Ephesians that tells us that our identity is actually perched. It's actually secured in the heavenlies. But he says something here that's absolutely amazing. Look at this. When he says in verse 10, for God is not unjust to forget your work. Listen, what you want to do, friends, all of us as a church. Now, this, you guys are Wednesday nighters. You can take this. The Sunday group, they'd get up and walk out. <laughs> verse 10, there's, uh, there's something that is implied. He's not, even in, he's not even questioning it. You see it? Verse 10, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. He's announcing, the, you guys are followers of Jesus. You guys, listen, wheels up, you're moving on. You're not stuck back in the past and you've, you've, you've laid the foundation, you've put the principles into place. And the fact of the matter is, cheer up, my friends, he would say, God has not forgotten the work that you have been working and the labor that you've been laboring to honor and glorify his name. I think that's incredible. So when you study that, the first thing that comes shouting back at you is, Lord, I have to apply verse 10 in my own life. Don't raise your hand, but if I were to ask you, are you a believer, your hand would pop up. But then if I went on to say, well, okay, great. Oh, your hand is up, you right there, you know, in the blue shirt, so to speak. Uh, speak to us a moment about the work and the labor that God has worked through you to glorify his name. What's your testimony? You see? You see, Jack, I mean, that's kind of, well, that's a little personal. Exactly. He's a personal God. So the challenge to us is, and that's why we're here right now, is the Lord is saying to you and I, 
Jack, I want you to be able to write down on a piece of paper when you go home and get a loan, what are the works that I do through you? And what is the labor that you put forth to honor my name? This has nothing to do with salvation. That's been settled. Now that you're saved, how about this? The rain comes down. It hits the soil and the seeds pop up. He's saying to us now, my Holy Spirit is in you. Take an inventory as to how you're progressing. This is not one of those things where, oh, sorry, you're out of the kingdom. Eh, door opens up, you go straight to hell, you're out. <laughs> it's not that. This is like, a, you know, a tune-up. You take your car to get a tune-up. So how, you go to the doctor. Doc, how am I doing? Right? Pulls on things, squeezes things, pushes things, pokes, stabs, and then charges you. <laughs> We're, we're to be examined spiritually, and the Lord is saying, all right, wheels up, let's go. So here's the thing. And it's implied that we be encouraged by this. The pendulum swings to this area. And listen, I am not speaking from some ivory tower. I know exactly this challenge. Pastor, do you know what it takes for me to get here on a Wednesday night? I got to put up with that traffic. I actually get out of work a little early to get here. And I'll be back at it again tomorrow morning at six o'clock. And yes, I do know that. And I live that as well. You're honoring God by being here. Applying yourself to the study of his word that your faith might grow. Amen. Here's the point though. If your faith grows, God's going to want to do something with it. With it. Right now, my daughter is watching this live cam. It's a, uh, it's a hummingbird live cam. I don't know where the hummingbirds are at, but somebody set up a 24-hour live cam. And the little two baby hummingbirds are in there. And she's watched them from an egg to now... She goes, Dad, check this out. And they're, they're little guys, but they're in the nest together, just stuck in there, little tiny things. And uh, it's funny because each one tries out their wings. But it's so much like church. It's very cute. They're all packed in together, two of them, in a little tiny nest. When one tries its wings out, it's slapping the other one in the face. And he's going, and the other one's going. And then the other one does it, and the other one's getting hit. But you th think about what's going on. And they're, they're changing. The feathers now are there. And they're, it's amazing. The hummingbird, when it's, when it's uh, hatched, it's got a little tiny little speck of a beak, like, like sand, like the size of a grain of sand. And it's grown like every day. It's like, like Pinocchio. It's like, whoa. I mean, it's out there now. Why? What's happening? Get pretty soon, wheels up. They'll be out on their own. But they're getting ready. And God has been getting you ready. God wants you to be a servant of his, a minister of his. Everywhere you go. So isn't that for professional people like you? No, it's not. It's for all of us. It's remarkable. And then he says to us in that verse 10, he says, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So this is the huge thing. This is what you and I must answer. That for you and I, we've got to find out what it is that God would have us to do and then do it with all of our heart. We cannot, friends, listen, we cannot pass into glory having never known or discovered what ministry purpose did God put us on this earth for. Did you hear that? You guys all need to write that one down or, some, or have it tattooed on something. You got to have this. Don't live your life to its end, never knowing why you were born or brought into this world. God is the one who knows the reason why you were given life. You, I mean this 
I've lived this, and there's times when I go back and relive it, to where you are, you can't settle for anything less than to plead with God with, as it were, vehement tears and crying. Oh God, what's my purpose? Don't think for a moment when UCLA gave you that degree that that's the purpose of your life. That's great. But that's built into the purpose of your life. That's not the purpose of your life. Well, you know, I arrived. I did this and I did the other and I got a boat and an airplane and the, uh, the house on the hill or the, the, and I've arrived. What's your purpose for living? What is your purpose? Well, I just got a platinum album. But what's your purpose? What will last forever? Every believer, and listen, that should cause all of us on this Wednesday night to spiritually catch fire. I am not going to stop pursuing you, God, until I find out from you what the purpose of my life is for. Amen. And you, listen, you stay on them. In my mind, I'm hearing a guy who told me this Three decades ago, he was from Louisiana, and he said, I want you to, because that's, I want to know why he saved me. That was my thing. I, I wouldn't leave the pastors at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa alone. I, I want to know. I want to know. I'd drive them nuts. <laughs> and one guy, Justin Alfred, if you remember who he was, he just said, you're like white on rice. <laughs> That was, you're like white on rice. <laughs> or you're like a dog on a bone. And you said, that pleases the heart of God. <clears throat> Didn't Jesus say, knock, keep on knocking, ask, keep on asking, seek, keep on seeking. Mm -hmm. But for how long? It doesn't matter how long, because you're not going to stop asking, seeking, and knocking. Are you desperate? I pray that every one of us become very desperate before God. Yes. Jacob was des de desperate when he was wrestling with the Lord. Remember that? He's wrestling with the angel Lord. And there the Bible tells us, he's, he tells the angel Lord, which is none other than the Theophanies, pre-existent appearance of Christ. Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Amen. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. God, I'm not going to shut up until you bless me. I want to know the reason why I've been brought into this world. There's a greater glory that God has for you. For every one of us. And here's the fun part about that challenge is that not one of us has arrived at that Amen. glory. He's doing it, but we haven't finished it. So, oh, hey, how are you? I'm good. I finished. I'm. <laughs> I just totally filled up all the glory. <laughs> no. It's possessive. You have to have him. And notice here that it involves serving. This flies in the face of the world. It will always fly in the face of the world. The world says, serve me. Jesus says, serve one another. Amen. When the world serves us, our heads go like this. And we get entitled and we whine and gripe about everything. You know people like that? Do you remember, have you ever been to a hotel and you got room service for the first time in your life? Have you ever experienced that? You should experience it once in your life. Where you go, you don't, you check into the room and you actually, it, it's like, wait. What? Are you going on a cruise ship for the first time in your life? And they just go, we're here to serve. And it's like, yeah, sure. I'm sure you're supposed to say that. And then like you're in your room and you can pick up the phone and you say, uh, can, can we have some ice cream? <laughs> Absolutely. Would you like anything else? <laughs> what kind of ice cream? Uh, seriously, this happened to us. Um, he's asking what kind of ice cream we want. <laughs> and, the, and the guy in the other, fa the, the, guy, the guy in the ice cream department, he goes, don't worry about it. I'll bring, I'll bring 
a little bit of but of, of it all. Well, but I didn't. I'm, but I wanted popcorn to popcorn coming. <laughs> How much is that, sir? You that you when you got your ticket, that it's all in. You want? To, we're here for you twenty four seven. It's like, and you set the phone down. <laughs> Seriously, you got to do this once in your life. Why? It's like a little bit of heaven. Okay. And you feel bad. The guy brings it. I didn't know this either. The guy brings it and I'm fumbling around to tip the guy. And he goes, you already tipped me. What? You tipped me when you bought this ticket. It's all built in. Oh so my gosh. You've got, to, I need a counselor. I need someone to tell me what else is available to me that I'm, I don't want to miss anything. I'm not, listen, sir, I'm not going to let you go until you tell me everything that's for me. We need to grab God and say, Lord, what is it? What is it? What is it that you have for me in this life? I don't want to miss anything. If I could have had ice cream and popcorn at the same time, I want to know. Which leads us to this. Look at verses 11 and 12. It's a persevering glory. Because that glory of the Holy Spirit, he's yearning within us. Heaven. He speaks overtures of heaven. That God is taking us to heaven. Heaven's real. Heaven's an actual place. Listen, heaven was in existence before this dirt bulb earth was ever created. Heaven has always been the dwelling presence of God. <laughs> awesome. Verse 11 says, and we desire that each one of you the desire is for every one of God's kids to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 6 tells us, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Is that an awesome verse? Think about that. Look at that. Number one, God's got a gift for you. It's got to get stirred up. We've got to draw that out. This is important stuff. Paul tells Timothy, I want to remind you about this gift. It needs to be stirred up. And by the way, uh, it has always been, even in ancient times and in New Testament times, this laying on of hands where you pray for one another. It's like, it's not, it's not magic, but there's something about communion and koinonia fellowship among brothers and sisters. When you pray, there's, there'll be maybe some people together and they'll pray for one another. They'll see a, maybe a group of older men here at church or older women together. And I think this is awesome. I highly encourage this. Where maybe a, a couple of young ladies would, would say, um, excuse me, but we, we see that you guys you know, are older and you've walked with Jesus longer and we, would you pray for us? Would you lay hands on us and pray for us? Listen, we, we go through life so often not having because we don't ask. And what's amazing here about this is that in that verse of 1 Timothy 1, 6, we're not supposed to have as verse 7, it says that we're not supposed to have a spirit of fear. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. People, please, we're almost done. A spirit of fear is, frankly, it's just the, it's, it's the demonic powers playing with you. There's nothing good that ever comes out of fear. Ever. And notice how connected this is the countermeasures to that is to know the power and the love of God so that you have a sound mind. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that Jesus, when he went to Gadara, so those of you who have been there, remember Galilee, uh, if north is 12 o'clock, at about 1 o'clock is the village of Gadara or the Gadarenes. Well, there's no village there anymore. Nobody 
It's, it's abandoned because it's got all this ancient pagan stuff. It's, there's tombs that are there. Uh, for thousands of years, those tombs have been there. Well, do you remember when Jesus got in a boat and he goes over there? It's a very amazing portion of New Testament scripture. He gets in a boat, he goes over to the Gadarenes or Gadara, steps out of the boat and two demoniacs come rushing him from the tombs. And one of them says, Jesus, have you come to torment us before the time? We know who you are. And the gospels single out one man where Jesus ministers to him and the Bible says that he was loosed from the demon. Remember the famous, Jesus says, tell me what's your name? Isn't that weird? Jesus says, I mean, not, I mean weird does, not to Jesus. Jesus looks at this guy and says, what's your name? And Jesus isn't even talking to the guy. He's talking to the guy, but he's not talking to the guy. What's your name? And he says, Legion, because we are many. And what's bizarre to me, but Jesus knows all things and he knows the end. They asked him from that man's mouth. They said, will you allow us to go into the pigs? Don't cast us. Basically, they were saying, don't throw us into hell. Don't. Don't put us in prison yet. Allow us to possess the pigs. And in some, did Jesus point? Did he give the thumbs up? Did some, they, some, and wham, they went. And the Bible tells us that 2,000 pigs got possessed and ran down the cliff. By the way, in the entire Sea of Galilee, Gadara is the only place that has a cliff. And they ran right off into the sea. And those kinds of pigs, by the way, in the Middle East, it's very bizarre. When they try to swim, their, their hooves in such a way, when they swim, they can't swim. But when they try to swim, they actually, they slit their throats wide open when they swim. They go like this. It's very bizarre. Very sick. And the Bible tells us that that man was completely in his right state of mind and made whole. And do you know what he said? You know what he said. You read the Bible. He said to Jesus, I'll follow you. I'm, I'm, coming, at, I'm coming with you. Wherever you go, wherever you go, I'm following you. I'm going with you. And Jesus said, no, you're not. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's called negative church growth tactics. <laughs> Jesus said, no, you're not. He said, go home and tell your family what great things God has done for you today. Guess what happened? Boy, we don't have the time to get into this. Guess what happened? He went back. He went back home. We later find out in the book of Acts that that man went home to Scytopolis. You don't know that name. Scytopolis in Hebrew is the town of Bethshean. Many of us have been to Beth Shin. It's one of the Decapolis, the 10 cities. Deca, 10. Capolis, Decapolis, 10 cities. Say, so who cares? There was a huge, huge revival that started in Scytopolis, which was one of the 10 cities of the Decapolis, but in Hebrew is known as Beth Shin. And it happened from that one former demoniac. Wow. Is God great? God is awesome. And so verse 11 says, show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. I want to just give you this blast of scripture and we'll wrap this up. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Luke 16, 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon or in the, the, using the money of this world, if you can't be trusted in that, how, uh, who will commit to your trust uh, true riches? If you're faithful in a little bit, God says, I'll make you faithful in more. If you can't handle money, why should you have more money? 
Money's an interesting thing because it's either a great, great tool. In fact, it's the greatest tool on earth or it's the worst master that you could have. In the same token, if you are faithful in a little bit, God says, I'll make you faithful in more. Depends on how you use it. Money's not evil. Remember that, everybody. What is? The love. Exactly. It's the love of money. That's powerful and important. Verse 12 will end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. That word imitate means that we need to have people, listen up, we need to have people in our lives. This is your homework. Find someone, ask God to give you someone in your life for you to imitate them. That means you need to get to know people. So don't do that. I'm a pretty private person. Well, knock it off. That's why, by the way, people need to get back to church. I do church at home. No, you don't. You, you, you watch Bible studies at home. It's not church. Unless you have to deal with a parking lot and find a seat, and it's not church. You got to get together. You can't, you can't do that. You've got to come together. Why? Because you're going to meet somebody whose faith you want to mimic. Every single one of us need a mentor. I want, to, I want to leave you with this. This is awesome. Jonathan Edwards, the great American intellect and Puritan theologian, president of both Princeton University and Union College. Listen to this. It becomes, it becomes, it becomes us to spend this life only as a journey toward heaven. Wow. To which we should subordinate all other concerns of life. Really? All other concerns of life. I agree with them. I'm just being sarcastic in front of you because some people will say, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to be a Jesus freak or anything. <laughs> well, we don't want to mix religion and politics, nor do I. Everything belongs to God. Amen. There's no separation. Why should we labor for or set our hearts on anything else but that which is our proper end and true happiness? Edwards went on to say, I resolve to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can. This is the great Puritan preacher. What is he saying? I live every day to ensure that when I'm judged by my Jesus in heaven, that I was faithful, that I did what he told me to do, I figured out what he wanted me to do, and I did that to the fullest, because why? Because when I get to heaven, I want to make sure that I have the best time ever. You see, that sounds weird. It sounds amazing. We think like that in the world on other things. Make sure we do this. Make sure we do that. Get the car filled up. We got to make sure we got the right campsite. Make sure you get the right stuff. We do all this for life. Did you get the right sunscreen? <laughs> right? We get all these things. We got all the plans. We plan everything. And then we lollygag around about heaven. And God said, hey, how about, how about planning like that for heaven? So let's stand. I'm going to ask you to allow me to pray over you, over us. <laughs> I would love to be able to say, I'm just part of the illustration is, I'd love to be able to say to you, okay, all of you guys that are here this Wednesday night, tomorrow at four o'clock in the afternoon, meet me down at LA Harbor. We're going to get on this big cruise ship. All of you have got balconies, <laughs> popcorn and ice cream. <laughs> We're going to sail five days to Hawaii. We're going to go to all of the islands. Five days back. We're going to have an amazing time together. And 
we're all gonna gain anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds <laughs> and have a blast. And if I, if I were to say, um, you know, all you need to do is see me after service and I've, I've, got the, I've got your key to your room, the card to get on board the ship. Listen, some of you would say, I'm on that. <laughs> some of you would say, I don't think it's true. Right? I don't know if that's true. Well, I want you to know, God wants you to receive this prayer. How's that? Amen. Father, I pray right now for these precious, precious saints. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, you have promised us the Holy Spirit's empowerment. You already indwell every believer, but you've promised to come upon your children, us, for ministry service. You've made it clear in the word that we will really not really know ourselves nor be happy until we are loving others, just like you. But Lord, we confess tonight, that's foreign to us. We don't even know where to begin. So Lord, we ask you tonight to baptize us afresh tonight or fill us or in endow us with power from on high. We don't care. Lord, you know what we need. Holy Spirit, take over in our lives that we might be a people that serve you in righteousness and in honor. And Lord, that you would take from me those things that have kept me from moving on further with you. Take from me these things that have beset me. Kids or parents or worry or money or health, whatever it is that's distracted me from seeing you bigger. Lord, I give that to you tonight. And Lord, you said in Luke's gospel, chapter 11, that even earthly dads know that when their kids ask for bread, they won't give them a scorpion. When they ask for an egg, a loving dad is not going to give them a stone. You said, Jesus, how much more then will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to you who ask? So, Father, I pray that right now, every one of us would ask, dear Lord, fill me afresh with the power of your precious, precious Holy Spirit. And Lord, live your life through me. Dear God, do what you want. I yield completely to you from this moment forward. And I ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, amen. amen. Let's close in worship. God bless you guys.